Uh, hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming and for braving the February cold to come out to this uh, event this evening. It's wonderful to see so many people here, which I think is such a fantastic endorsement for the excitement and interest in the conversation that we're going to be having this evening. Uh, I'm Damien Radcliffe. I'm one of the professors here at the School of Journalism and Communication, and I curate the year-round demystifying media speaker series, of which this talk uh, is a part. The series brings leading academics and industry professionals to the University of Oregon to talk about their work. I'm very excited that our guest this evening, uh, Tom Bowman, is going to talk about his role as the uh, Pentagon correspondent for NPR. Uh, Tom, in conjunction with his wife, Bridget Schulte, are here for the whole week, or pretty much the whole week, on campus as part of our Journalist in Residence program. That gives us an opportunity to have an extended visit from high-profile journalists who uh, immerse themselves in the kind of the classroom experience with our students and with faculty, sharing their expertise and insights. It's a real privilege for us to be able to get up close with them over the course of a couple of days. We learn so much from that experience and we're very grateful for their time and insights. Also very fortunate this evening that we're going to be joined by Rachel McDonald, the news director from KLCC. KLCC is a long-term strategic partner for the School of Journalism and Communication, and tonight's event is being held and organized in partnership with them. Tom is going to say a few words of introduction. We're going to hear some of his uh, recent work. Then Rachel will uh, interview him before we open to a Q&A from uh, those of you in the audience who have questions, I'm sure you all do, that you want to ask Tom. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tom Bowman and Rachel McDonald. <laughs> Thanks, Damien. Um, it's great to be here. Um, the journalism program here is top notch. I talked to some of the classes today and yesterday. It's a really good program, and the students are excellent, really good questions. It's always good to see. Um, so I'm the Pentagon correspondent with NPR. I uh, spent a lot of time in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Any time I can get out of Washington is a good day for me, especially in this day and age. And you'll, I tell friends of mine who were at the Pentagon and other reporters in Washington, that you'll never understand what's going on unless you leave Washington. Washington is a theme park. I can push a button and I know what that person's going to say, Democrat, Republican. You'll never understand it unless you go to places like Syria or Afghanistan or Iraq or out into the country, right, to Oregon, Iowa, talk to real people. You can't sit in Washington and talk to members of Congress and uh, analysts, right? You'll never understand what goes on. More reporters have to, have to get outside. I started my career at the Baltimore Sun and worked with uh, a guy named Jack Germond, an old political correspondent, and Jules Whitcover. These guys were real reporters. They would not sit in Washington. They were always on the road going to diners, talking to union leaders, politicos out in the field. They had a better sense of what was going on at that time, I think. I think we've lost that. It's too comfortable to sit back and push that button. But you're not going to get the real story. So the, the benefit of, for me going to places like this, despite the fact that they're horribly dangerous, and we lost two colleagues two years ago. David Gilkey was one. Uh, from Portland. Um, we lost him and a translator, Zabi Tamana, on a patrol in Afghanistan. Um, really, really good people. Um, and the great thing about going to the field is you get to talk to soldiers and Marines and talk about what they're going through, how many tours they've been. You can talk to the generals and the admirals, and they'll have a certain view of what goes on, and they'll clearly try to spin you, because the higher you go up there in rank, the more political it becomes. And some of these guys I like, but clearly it's political, and they know it, and we know it. And the great thing about going to the field, talking to these guys, is you'll get a better sense of what's going on. They're more honest, I think. And they've seen things that some of these other guys have not. And their attitude is, what are they going to do to me, sending me to Afghanistan? <laughs> So you have to go talk with those people. And with reporting, I always tell young reporters and college students, if you cover a city, you've got to know the mayor, you've got to know the police chief, you've got to know 
and members of the city council. But if you don't know the beat cops and the waitresses and the guys carrying garbage, you'll never understand a city. You have to get out there and talk to regular people. That's very important. That's all I got. <laughs> Tom, thanks for being here and um, sharing, sharing some of your stories with us. You talked a little bit about your history having been with the Baltimore Sun and then working at NPR. What was that transition like going from print to radio? Um, well, let me first explain how I got to NPR. I was a print guy for many years, almost 20 years at the Baltimore Sun. And it was a great old paper. We had 10 farm bureaus when I started there in the 1980s. And a classic Washington bureau, again, Jack Germond and Woodcover, some of these guys, classic old time reporters. And they kept cutting back and cutting back. And those 10 farm bureaus all went away. And they kept cutting back on staff and staff. And our editor, whose name is Bill Marimo, started complaining, went to the publisher and said, you are cutting too much, you can't do that. And she said, really? You're fired. <laughs> and it sent a shockwave through the newsroom and the industry. He was a big deal. Two Pulitzer Prizes. He's still in the business. He runs the Philly Inquirer now. Great, great editor. So NPR picks him up. And a few reporters, friends of mine, you may have heard these names, David Green, David Fulkenflick, Laura Sullivan, Frank Langford in London, they all went before me to NPR. And I was at a panel with Laura Sullivan at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. I said, well, how do you like this radio thing? And she said, the place is great. You have to come over. I said, it's broadcast. Those people are weird. We don't do broadcast. We're print people. I'm going to die a print reporter right at my desk. And she said, listen, you have to come. Right? They send people around the world. It's a huge organization. You have to talk to Bill, the guy that was fired. I said, well, listen, if Bill wants to talk to me, um, I'll talk with him. So she calls me the next day and says, Bill says come in tomorrow morning. So I go walk into his office. He said, you're a finalist for the Pentagon job. I said, Bill, Bill, I'm a print guy. I don't do radio. He said, ah, don't worry. They'll teach you how to do it. <laughs> and it was an interesting transition. It's a, you're using different muscles to tell a story, right? It's, it's not, it's, the writing has to be tighter. It has to be vivid, but you're not writing much on your own. You're using the sound in other people's voices to move the story. And it's a challenge at first, right? Using the equipment, how do I put together that puzzle? Once you kind of get into it and understand it, it is the best. Because a human voice is like nothing else. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, they can't copy that pathos in the voice. They can't. I remember Steve Inskeep talking to two women who lost sons in Iraq, and the pain in their voice. You can't replicate that by the, by the printed word. You can't. So that's the fun part. Um, and going to places like this, like Syria, and talking to people about what they've been through, and the natural sound you can pick up going there. And as I tell, talking to classes today, what the great thing with radio is, I want you to put me there. Take me to where you're going. Uh, is it a diner? Right? You know, you're writing about a diner, you'll say, I'm at Larry's Diner, established 1947 in Eugene. With radio, you're opening the door. There might be a little bell, right, in the old door. Two old-timers sitting there have been having coffee there since 1953. <laughs> Listen to their conversation, record their conversation. What's on the grill? Something's on that grill, and it's sizzling. It's bacon, right, home fries. Tell, it, take me to that diner. I want to be in that diner. So when I'm driving down in Alexandria, Virginia, driving down the highway, I want to be in that diner. Or I want to be in that battle zone, right? So you think about what sound can I use to put your, the listener into that diner, right? Don't tell me you're outside a diner. Show me. 
well, with that sound. Let's listen to this story since we're talking mm -hmm. about the voices and being in right. this spot. And I could just do an intro on this. So this is last fall in Syria. Um, we went in with the U.S. military and the Kurdish uh, rebels, and we went into um, this school in Raqqa, which was the former uh, capital of the Islamic State. And all these children were traumatized by war. They lost parents, they lost siblings, some of them lost limbs, some of them were horribly burned. And uh, we would just kind of went in there and talk to people about what they were doing. Now to Syria for a look at a U.S.-backed school for children traumatized by war and by ISIS. The program is in danger. It might not survive the Trump administration's cuts in aid for Syria, and it could come down to donations from other countries or private individuals to keep it going. NPR's Tom Bowman visited the school and spoke with the children while he was traveling with the U.S. military in the Syrian city of Raqqa. This skinny boy says he's 12, though he looks years younger. He points to a crayon drawing he created this summer when he arrived at this childcare center. It's mostly colored in black. There's a tank, an aircraft, a crude figure of a man with a wispy beard holding an oversized gun. This is when I shelled my home. My sister and niece were killed, just like that, two missiles. There's a red tongue of flame rising from the roof of his home. When the house was hit, the smoke was red, like this. Therapists have known for decades a primary way young children communicate and comprehend trauma is by drawing pictures. If that's true, these drawings on the wall are one collective scream. There are childish scrawls of beheadings, corpses, planes dropping bombs. One small boy gestures to the picture he made his eyes are pinched by burns. This school and 10 others like it is designed to ease the kids back into something like a normal life. It's everything from art to music to sports. Dini Holder is a State Department official who helps oversee the child care centers in northeast Syria, an area controlled by U.S. forces and its Kurdish and Arab allies. What we found is that the children had been so traumatized they couldn't even recognize numbers and letters. So we had to work through that before we could actually start educating them again. The school's outer walls are painted with colorful toy bears and balloons. It sits just a block or two from piles of rubble and skeletons of buildings destroyed by ISIS booby traps and American airstrikes. There are about 500 kids here with space for hundreds more. We're not identifying any of the Syrians for security reasons. A Syrian teacher instructs a small classroom, just seven boys and girls who never went to school during the years of war. She says the children were afraid to be inside any building or even on the roads. They just didn't feel safe because of the bombings and destruction they witnessed. First, they were still carrying memories of the war, and they had lost people close to them. Some had lost their fathers. Some had lost both their parents. She points to two girls in the back of the room, one stares blankly at the floor, thumbing the pages in her book. The other covers her face with her hands, peering through a web of fingers at the visitors in the room. They had an obvious case of social isolation. In the beginning, she says, they didn't talk to anyone at all. Thankfully, they've recovered. They've adapted to the new place and adapted to their new friends. One boy in the class lost both his legs and sits in a wheelchair. Another is 13 and lost his left hand. He and two other children were playing with a bomb. When it exploded, it killed both his friends. Dini Holder says the schools like this in the area, helping these kids, are part of a program that costs about $13 million in U.S. funds. But the money will run out in just four months. We're working very hard with the international community to explain to them the many different ways that they could be involved in the education sector. President Trump cut $200 million in aid. What impact did they have in your program? Um, basically, part of the education programming money was tied up in the money that was stopped. So instead of having a full year coming up, um, I will basically end funding at the end of January. Holder says there's hope from other countries who are kicking in aid money. The United Arab Emirates gave $50 million, but prefers the money is spent on projects like water and electricity. 
Saudi Arabia is providing $100 million, but it's uncertain whether it can be used for the schools. Private donations, officials say, can also help fill the gap. For $1.5 million, Holder says she could renovate 100 schools. For about $5 million, the care centers could continue for another year. Whatever the fate of these schools, there are signs of hope. Girls in red and white uniforms perform a dance routine on a stage, and the boy who lost his hand in an explosion shows a picture he just drew in his notebook. It's a bouquet of flowers. And that boy whose black crayons pictured an ISIS fighter in the burning home the family left to flee to Lebanon, next to that one is a new and more vibrant drawing of his home. I was so happy I drew this. This is when we returned. We rebuilt our house and now we are very happy. He draws the house in bold and bright colors, all yellow, orange, blue, and red. Tom Bowman, NPR News, Raqqa, Syria. Do you know what's the situation with that school now? I mean, she mentioned the end of January. Right, it's still uncertain. They're still looking for money. Um, again, Trump cut 200 million. They're still um, trying to get money from other countries. And um, all the State Department people left the country when Trump ordered um, people out. So they're still, they're still scrambling to come up with money. There's a huge need. I, I asked you this earlier about, you know, the, um, the fact that, that the money, some of the money being used in this emergency declaration that Trump made for the border wall would be coming from funds for military construction, but would it affect things like this as well? No, that would be, about th this money is State Department money, mm -hmm. USAID money, so um, you could still put money in the budget for this. Now, whether they do when the budget comes out in March is uncertain, but the State Department people like Deanie Holder, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're pushing for it. She came up to me after that interview and kind of half joked and said, just don't get me fired. And the next day, her boss came up to me and said, hey, Tom, that stuff that Deanie told you, can you just leave it out of the story? I said, no. No, she was being honest, and it's a vital part of the story. I can't leave it out. He was a nice guy. He said, yeah, I figured I'd ask. <laughs> when you're talking to, you know, children who've been traumatized by war, is it challenging to get them to open up? Is, how do you approach kids and adults in these kinds of situations? Um, well, clearly the teacher was eager to talk. She's working and trying to help these kids. And also you kind of look around. Who, who seems eager to talk? So this one kid who lost his hand was waving his drawing with his <laughs> other hand. So clearly he's eager to talk. But the two little girls in the back of the room, I, there's no way I was going to approach them. They were clearly traumatized, and I don't want to, you know, harm them anymore. So you kind of scope it out, who's kind of coming up to you, laughing, joking, and, you know, very sensitively you say, you know, would you, through the interpreter, would you like to talk with us? When you're traveling like that, tell us a little bit about sort of how it works. You're traveling with an interpreter and a producer, Kind of, and, and you're traveling with. How are you went in with the around? U.S. military. No, another uh, some of our reporters. So I went in with um, a, a columnist of the Washington Post, David Ignatius, and a CNN team. So it was a small group of us. I went in with the U.S. military. So we flew to Kuwait City, and then flew with them from Kuwait right into Syria. The great thing was there's no visa. <laughs> I didn't have to go with visa. We're basically flying into Syria basically illegally, right? Um, but you can drive in there, and one of our other reporters, Ruth Sherlock, drives in, and what you do is you fly into Erbil, Iraq, you hire a driver and a fixer, and you just drive that highway uh, right into Syria, and then you, you're handed off to the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces who are working with the Americans. Um, so we're trying to get back for a final trip, 
because it looks like ISIS is going to be defeated. I'm hearing as soon as tomorrow they could announce the end of the caliphate, but anybody that knows this business knows that you can never predict when something is going to happen, like the end of the war or end of the battle. It just continues. But I would like to try to get back in there to visit the school again, see how these kids are doing. Is the money still there? How many more kids need help? And the interesting thing from here on in is Trump wants everybody out. Guys I was talking with over there say, we, we have to stay at least another year to stabilize this area so ISIS doesn't come back. People need water and sewer and help removing these uh, booby traps from these houses. See, when ISIS left Raqqa, and it, the image I talk about is like Dresden in World War II. That's what this place looks like. I've never, and I've been doing this 20 years, I've never seen anything like this. It's demolished. But when ISIS left, an insidious thing they did was they peppered this whole area with more booby traps. They put it in door jams. They put it in chairs. They put it in teapots, baby bottles. So when families tried to go back to their homes, explosions. A lot of kids lost limbs. People were killed. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Thousands of them are in Raqqa. And the Americans are training young uh, Syrians to go in there and just remove these bombs so people can move back. So this is a, this is a great need. Um, what they're talking about now, you know, since Trump said everybody out, all 2,000 Americans out, and these guys are telling me, we just can't leave. But, you know, ISIS will come back. These people need help. What is rarely reported is the French and the British are there as well. But they try to keep a low profile. They have a couple of hundred each uh, commandos there. So what the Americans are trying to do is say, what, why don't you stay, the Brits and the French? And they're like, whoa, whoa. We're not staying without you guys. So that's where we are now. Will the administration allow 300, 500 200 Americans to stay to work with the Brits, to train local police forces, to bring in aid money, to at least get this place, I wouldn't say to a state of normalcy, but at least heading in that direction. So that's the debate that's going on as we speak. And they may come up with something next month, so keep an eye out on that. It sounds like you feel somewhat hopeful. I mean, do, do you feel like there's hope for Syria that, that it could oh, it's, be No, done. it's going to get worse before it gets better because you have that area north of Damascus, Idlib, three million people there. A lot of Al-Qaeda has moved into there, some ISIS, mostly Al-Qaeda, and anti-Assad rebels. And the sense is in the coming weeks, months, they're just going there and just, you know, just take everybody out. It's going to be, it's going to be bad. Assad clearly has is in a, a pretty good position. Well, let's on that note. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, when I, when I talk to my friends about what I'm doing, what I'm working on, they usually say, Tom, every time I talk to you, I'm just more depressed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I think if, if folks have questions, we can open up to, to audience questions. I'm going to steal your mic for each other. Can I take a couple at once or one at a time? Uh, one at a time is good. Okay. Yes. Sir? So can you just see it? So it's really awesome. Oh, I think I'm loud enough. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. Mr. Warren, I'm glad you started your comment by saying uh, you're interested in talking to regular people, whatever that means, regular. Uh, to be able to do that in the Middle East, uh, in West Asia, you have to speak the languages of the countries you travel to. Mm -hmm. Do you speak Farsi, Arabic, Kurdish? Um, Pashto, any of them? Unfortunately, no. So you did not speak in lingua franca of these countries at all, did you? Right. Okay. But no, I have, we have translators with us. Well, yeah, we so you want to translate it. Just right. like, for instance, I go to uh, Baltimore and talk to a, a native of you know, Baltimore, and then he translates for me. Having said that, based on what I just heard, there is uh, by the way, I'm not a fan of NPR, I would like to tell you honestly, because I, I find it to be superficial. And uh, it not explain, for instance, why, why this horrible catastrophe has to be fallen on Syria and this school. And then 
I also tell you that I'm really baffled that how you guys go about living like that because you have this love affair either with the United States military machine or with the Israelis that you have never really told the truth to the American people. It's a very descriptive, shallow description. <coughs> this story? Well, this, not only the story of Syria, I, I learned whatever I learned from, the, I, I usually, as a political scientist, I learned it from real sources, that is the sources that comes from Syria, the languages of the area that they write about, or occasionally, maybe uh, BBC or the Canadian sources. American sources, uh, when it comes to the Middle East, are extremely shallow. I cannot imagine how you guys, you know, how, how long are you going to keep this up? Mm -hmm. Where are you going, for instance, to tell, uh, especially in, let's in Syria, what are the Americans doing? What are the Americans invited to be there? Should we let, oh, Tom, <coughs> should we let Tom ask this? Because I don't believe that during the <coughs> past few days you have been on this campus. I don't think you have asked any of these questions. I don't think, you know, our, I don't think our faculty people here are principled enough yeah. to ask any of these questions from you. No, it's a good question. What is America doing in, in Syria? That's I've right. asked, no, hang on a second. I've asked that many times to a guy named Jim Mattis, who is defense secretary. Yes. What are you guys doing there? You weren't invited in. Is this illegal? And he said? He said, we're working through the UN. The UN set this up, and it's legal. That's what he said. That was his response. He also said, after ISIS is defeated, there was a resolution in the UN that told member states, and you can read it, I'm sure you've had, as a political scientist. Have you read the resolution? Yes, yes. It says member states will destroy the caliphate, will destroy these, this caliphate. But what did the caliphate came about? I'm sorry? What, what you don't say is that how did Islamic State came about? You see, how was it born? That is the essence of it, you see. How was it born? Who created it? You tell me. Well, if it, if it was created, there's a long history of uh, after uh, 1982. Uh, could you let someone else? I asked. Well, the man asking me a question. I know. Well, Bush the lesser created it when, when he started the Iraq War. Uh, no, that's true. That's true. And people at the Pentagon tell me, Tom, that's the worst decision this country has made in its history. That's Military true. people say that, so, and that's that's a larger discussion. This is a snapshot of what's going on in Syria. This is not a dissertation. No, I know, but I mean, that's exactly like what happened in Vietnam. It's, it's just a very really discursive uh, discussion of it. You, you really don't get to the nuts and bolts of the story. Because, have you read any books before you went there about the nature of the political culture of Syria, or Palestine, or Iran? I mean, if you haven't, then how can you possibly even talk to your uh, mind? Excuse me. Um, have you well, we can have a longer discussion later, if you'd like. Well, I mean, as long as you see you invite, for instance, I'm not invited at the desk. This lady was, I mean, she never asked you whether or not you speak any of the languages. I doubt very much any of your minders on this campus ask you to No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, and I don't, but we bring people but along with us. any questions like that. But we, I told you, we bring people with us who speak the language. You understand that? Yeah, well, of course, but I mean, that's not good enough. How many languages do you speak? Well, I speak three. Good for you. Well, yeah, but I mean... I okay, we'll talk later, okay? Um, have you spent any time in Palestine? I have not. Do you, is it of interest, or are you totally... I don't cover that. We have a reporter in Israel, and I'll give you his email so you can contact him. And... Um, you know, it's, so I cover the Pentagon, I cover military operations, military issues. So I go where the military is, you see, um, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, but all sorts of issues involving the military. Transgender policy, who's going to be the next Secretary of Defense, I mean all sorts of issues, not only overseas issues. Thanks for coming, Tom. Uh, I've been through these wars since the Vietnam era, and the U.S. has attacked all these countries that were not uh, wars of self-defense. Killed two million people in the Korean War, three million people in the Vietnamese, you know, we, none of these people ever attacked America, or Iraq never attacked America. So, what is the story from New York and Washington? I mean, uh, when does this stop? And it seems to me NPR has a daily drumbeat for another war in Venezuela. I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe it. I think we need to have uh, the U.S. Uh, hands off Venezuela.
Well, first of all, there would be no U.S. troops going to Venezuela, from what I get from the Pentagon. The, the issue with um, Venezuela is the 21 people in the embassy. They move, move most people out of the embassy. And there are Marine guards there protecting them. That's the issue with the Americans. If anything happens, it'll probably be a local force led by um, probably Brazil to go in a, as a peacekeeping force once the smoke clears, if Maduro leaves. That'll likely be the most logical thing that happens. But you're not going to see any U.S. troops on the ground there. I was talking to a guy recently, a senior Pentagon guy, he said it would be a disaster if the U.S. military went into Venezuela. It would make matters worse. We would never do that. So you, if Trump or someone else says all options are on the table, that's really not, not accurate. That option is not on the table. Um, what do you think of the Pentagon's audit? The audit? Yeah, clearly they're not uh, doing enough to keep an eye on where they spend the money. And that a lot of that is Congress's fault. Um, Congress has an oversight role. Congress has not done much oversight on Afghanistan, on Iraq, on Syria. They're silent because nobody wants to own it. J. William Fulbright had hearings on Vietnam two years after combat troops went to Vietnam. Two years. Is there a Fulbright today? Anybody? 18 years. They would welcome a general and say, so, general, what do you think about Afghanistan? Well, I'm, I'm going over there to take over American troops. I don't know, I'll let you know when I get there. 15 or 16 generals said the same thing. It's still a stalemate. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank KLCC for their wonderful news programming, which really informs our community. And um, Tom, you, from a print person, you have a great voice in radio, so you made a good move. My question, and then I think I got either from NPR or from the fabulous MSNBC, is about the Pentagon with Saudi Arabia somehow getting nuclear um, detailed technical information to help them build quote unquote nuclear power plants. And the comment was, well, why should they? How did this happen? They have a wealth of fossil fuels. And the reporter missed the whole point of this is a desert with total sunshine. They could go solar. So could you comment on that if you have that information? Um, I just read the story. I've been here the past week, and I read that story about there was an effort to get nuclear reactors to Saudi. I think H.R. McMaster thought it was a bad idea. My guess is it was being pushed by Jared Kushner. Um, yes. Just a guess, an educated guess. And I think it was just knocked aside. I think Mike Flynn was pushing it as well, the former National Security Advisor. And it apparently didn't go anywhere. But that's just what I got about it so far. Um, you talked about how important it is to go and speak with locals in the areas that you're writing stories about. Having been to these areas and studied it in depth, what would you say is the biggest disconnect between the public's perception of the war in Syria versus what you've noticed having actually encountered the people there? Um, my guess is the public has no idea why the U.S. is there. Right? I mean, they don't like Assad, but they don't have no sense of why American forces are there. Um, and President Obama just kind of moved in after a couple of Americans got their heads chopped off and said, we have to go in there and deal with this caliphate. Um, one of the issues was some of the plans for attacks on Europe and the United States came from Manbij, Syria, came from Raqqa, Syria. So the sense was, you have to go in there, get ISIS out of these cities, their safe havens, and deal with the caliphate. And that's where the UN resolution came in. That's why. But in Afghanistan, you know, Syria, Afghanistan, I think it's for most people, most readers, listeners, it's white noise. Um, 
And frankly, I think uh, there's one percent of this uh, population involved in the military. There's no draft. So therefore, it's an academic exercise for a lot of people, mildly interesting, but they have no stake in the game. The troops aren't allowed to talk. What's that? Special forces, of course, aren't allowed to talk at all. So that's one of the other block. You know, not only that there's so few military, but they're not allowed to talk to us. Well, they talk to me. I could sit here for another hour and tell you what people said to me about Afghanistan. I talked to a colonel in the Pentagon two weeks ago, four tours in Afghanistan. I said, if you, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? He said, walk out. Yeah. Another guy said, plant trees, out the button, go home. <laughs> you know what that guy was doing when he told me that? He was uh, head of the think tank, the commander's action group for the general running Afghanistan. So don't think that, this is not like Vietnam. This is not lockstep view of how things are going. There are a lot of people in the military that say, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of them. It's not, the, it's not like it was in the past. Thank you so much. Thanks for working to stay human, humane, and real in such a difficult environment where you are. By way of background, I'm asking you to, at NPR, to cover a deeper time cycle set of questions so we can stay sane and war free. Briefly, I was a science advisor, retired Air Force General Jack Kidd in his profound peacemaking work. He was head of the Air Force Nuclear Safety Center. There's things from him that have never been covered. I worked with Colonel Bob Bowman, a great being, great peacemaker. He was the head of Star Wars under two presidents. Now I'm president and chief science officer the Fukushima Awareness Project. Fukushima has barely been covered. As global warming kicks in, if you look at the military website, Department of Defense Climate Change Directive, Directive of course means an order, it says if you're in the military, you must prepare for a one and a half foot sea level rise within 20 to 30 years. That's conservative, that's required. It's probably going to be much more than that. What no one is covering anywhere is the following. The world's nuclear reactors will go underwater. There's 54 commercial nukes in Japan right next to the ocean. We have them in California and so forth. That's the death of the oceans. That's the death of the whales. It's the death of life on Earth. We need to have a longer perspective, which is not happening. I discovered there's a secret state agency in Oregon, Radiation Protection Services Division. KLCCOPB won't cover it, I've proven it. We need to look at how to prevent these problems. We can't allow the commercial nukes to go underwater. It's, we have to begin their legal shutdown now. Mm -hmm. And no one better than NPR, I think, can do this. Right. Can you work to take a look at that so we yeah, can cover yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that it, it was uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, he was the first one to raise the issue of climate change as a national security issue. And it, it was a couple of problems. One was the military bases, like Norfolk, Virginia. That place gets flooded now uh, during heavy rainstorms. They're worried about the military bases. They're also worried about this other issue with climate change, uh, with droughts in places like Africa. People are going to leave and go move into the cities. And the more people move into the cities, more destabilized cities become, start fighting one another, someone's going to have to deal with that issue, either a humanitarian issue or a military issue. It's, it's a huge problem. And Mike Mullen raised that, I think, more than a decade ago, because I used to cover him. You know what? Not many people are listening. So, in closing, please get NPR to cover much more of the reality of Fukushima. Three quarters of a ton of plutonium are in those three melting down reactors. Okay, got And it. the next phase, it's time to begin the end of commercial nuclear power for national security and public health reasons. We can do it. And NPR, please pay attention. We've got to address what happens if the nuclear power plants go underwater. That's inconceivable. It's time to do accelerated legal shutdowns of commercial nuclear power plants and tell us the truth about 
Fukushima. There's much more I'd love to talk to you about. Got about it. Fukushima. Thank you. I'm going to get in my, t my 10,000 steps today. <laughs> yes, you mentioned um, that the soldiers you talk to and up to the colonels and whatever uh, keep saying that they don't want these wars. And I believe you. Um, you know, been in the military myself. I wouldn't have wanted, wanted them either. And every time we have a president who they always tell us that they're going to listen to the troops and, you know, generals, and yet we still keep having these more wars. Who is it in Washington that's driving this? If it's not the military, the military doesn't want all these wars. Who does? And why? Um, well, I think the more recent wars, well, first of all, with, with Afghanistan, the more recent wars, I mean, it was the Taliban was harboring Al-Qaeda. 9-11 happened. And the White House said, we're going to go in and take out the Taliban if they don't turn over Al-Qaeda, right? So that happened. Nobody thought through what would happen after the Taliban goes, right? I would urge all of you to go back and listen to a speech President Bush made. April 6, 2002, at Virginia Military Institute. He talked about a Marshall Plan for Afghanistan. He talked about bringing democracy to Afghanistan. And I'd forgotten about it. And uh, an author of a book uh, on Afghanistan said, you go back and listen to it. I urge everybody to go back and listen to that. I want to find out the guy who wrote this speech. What were you thinking? Why? The poorest country outside of Africa, you're going to do what? You know how much has been spent so far there? A Almost a trillion. 2,500 Americans dead, 20,000 wounded, hundreds of thousands of Afghans. And it's for a stalemate that continues to this day, right? Uh, Iraq's a different story. I mean, there was no WMD. Why go in? The ripple effects of that we're going to be feeling for a long, long time. Uh, do you see signs that the U.S. military is slow walking the withdrawal from Syria still? Um, I wouldn't call it slow walking. I think what they convince the president of is you can't leave right away. ISIS has not been defeated despite what you say. It's not true. Um, I think what they want is to keep some sort of a, um, a force, Brits, French, Americans there to train a local force that can patrol Raqqa and Manbij and some of these other cities. You shouldn't have a six foot three blonde guy from Minnesota walking around Raqqa. You have to have local people do it. They know who's who. They know that you're a local resident, they know you're ISIS, right? Local people know, right? Um, so they want to kind of, President want everybody out in a month. They said it's going to take at least four months. But that follow-on force, what happens after, is what we're, they're talking about now. How much money goes in there to help these people who are in refugee camps, right? But the larger issue is, what's the future of Syria? You've got Russia, Iran, Assad still in power. He's not going to go anywhere. So what's the future? How long do you stay? I was, this is why I was asking Mattis, this gentleman here. On what authority do you stay in, in Syria? I said, it's illegal. He said, we're not going to go in here. We're not just going to walk out. I said, but on whose authority? And sir, we've had uh, many people on NPR questioning this. So don't say it's superficial. We're addressing these issues. Maybe you didn't hear that story that day, but we are addressing them. We're asking the right questions. We're having the right people on. I doubt you do. Because well, and I'll let, listen, let's, <laughs> come on. I doubt you. Well, we do. We frankly do. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a question about the workings of the Defense Department under the Trump administration. Because, I mean, you've covered foreign policy for a long time, and we've seen a much more volatile executive branch now than we have in a long time, 
So I was wondering what effects you've seen on the Pentagon from that. I mean, you mentioned Jared Kushner's role in foreign policy, and I mean, we were talking to Representative DeFazio this morning, who's, of course, pushing a big transportation bill, and he jokingly mentioned that Ivanka Trump was the only way to get through to the president's support. So I was just wondering, like, is this administration wholly untraditional in the way that it's handling foreign policy? And oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, there's no question. The, the Pentagon is just whipsawed all around with all these issues. Everything from transgender policy to um, bringing in more immigrants to serve in the military to Syria policy, Afghanistan policy, Iraq policy. It's all just, you know, it's, it's bedlam. Um, when I got back from Syria last February, those guys over there, we talked about stabilizing the Syria, you know, helping people, and they said, Tom, it's going to take at least another year and a half, maybe two years. I said, all right, got it. Get home. President Trump says, we're going to be leaving very shortly. So I go to this guy in the Pentagon, senior guy. I said, you know, I'm kind of confused. This is what these guys said. I get home, the president says, we're going to be out in two weeks. Do you guys have to go to the White House and kind of explain what you're doing? He looks at me and says, every freaking day. <laughs> he did not say freaking. <laughs> and transgender policy, you know, the transgender, you know, folks that were studying it at the Pentagon. How do we work this policy, you know, um, and so forth. And then Trump said one day, we're going to toss all the transgender folks out of the military. Mm. So I called the Pentagon. It's like, we don't know. We, we just saw the tweet like you did. So cross the board with all these issues. And now you have building the wall on the Mexican border. All that money is going to come from military construction projects worldwide, billions and billions of dollars. Um, recently, they sent 250 soldiers to a place called Eagle Pass, Texas, right? And I know someone very involved at the Pentagon in doing all this, planning all this. The reason they sent was because there were like 10, 20 buses or so heading up from Guatemala with families, desperate families. This guy told me, you wouldn't believe how much money we are spending for those soldiers. There was no time to set up tents and camps. They're putting them in motels and hotels and feeding them at local restaurants. He said, it's obscene how much money is being spent doing this. So I talked to one senior person, you would know his name right off, I'm not going to mention names, and I know this guy very well, and so I'm at a Christmas party, and he's going to be retiring soon, and I, I'm not going to ask him point blank about the elephant in the room, but he looked at me and he said, I can't wait to just walk on the beach, I am done. Uh, thanks again for being here. I appreciate it. And I apologize in advance um, if you have already covered this. I didn't get a chance to read all of your work while I was trying to keep my kids to not burn my house down. Um, I, I have, uh, I'm a middle school teacher. My wife works with a lot of uh, kids who have experienced trauma. And so I'm pretty passionate about making sure that people are treated as human beings and, and given that respect and honor. And um, as we've learned new information about PTSD and we continually... Uh, understand new aspects of how the human brain works and with your contacts at the Pentagon do you feel like um, our military and uh, the Pentagon in general are devoting enough resource to kind of interact with our, our soldiers and our military with trauma I really appreciate this story specifically trauma and, and coming out of a war zone but are we doing enough for our own soldiers so that they can reintegrate back into Eugene and Springfield and all these places? You're, you're probably not. I think they're trying to do a lot, but the, the volume of people coming back from these conflicts, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people, right? Um, and, you know, some go through the VA, clearly, but the volume going into the VA, they're not going to be building any huge VA hospitals anymore, right? So they're trying to have these people go to the private sector. They're coming up with a variety of programs. A former general is working at the Brain Institute out in Seattle, Pete Corelli, to try to figure out how, what research is out there. How can we find out how to help these people? Um, it's a really tough issue. 
and some of these people will never be 100% again. And um, suicide rate is off the charts. It's an awful problem, but this is what happens when you have an 18-year war and you cycle people in and out. I've met people who've done six tours, seven tours, who scream in the middle of the night. There was a study done, this is back when uh, Bob Gates was Secretary of Defense, a study done, mental health study by the Pentagon, and it said that these soldiers and Marines today are in combat longer, longer periods of time than any in the U.S. history. And they recommended for 30 days in combat, like 60 days off. And I asked Gates about that. It's all in time. And he said, we can't do that because we don't have enough soldiers and Marines. We can't. And I said, so, you're going to just be dealing, this is, you know, a long time ago. I said, so what do you do with these people when they come home? He said, we'll just have to deal with them. It's all on tape. Thank you, Tom. I uh, was just wondering, you touched on this a, a, a couple questions ago, but um, there is, seems to be a huge dichotomy between uh, the administration's use of the military for political gain, uh, taking, like you mentioned, the, the, the funding from the building uh, for the wall, also sending troops down to the border, uh, the transgender policy, the erratic uh, decisions that are tweeted out uh, about troop movements and withdrawals. Um, all that's going on, but if uh, you come out as an anti-war, you're seen as a anti, not a patriot or uh, an American, you know, against the military. And but the administration is the one who seems to be really abusing the military. Are they uh, still holding any support? And if not, with the morale you talked about, is that being reported on um, much? I haven't heard a lot on NPR. The morale of the military? Yes. I think it's generally pretty good. But clearly, we're, we're seeing, as the president, you ne you rarely seen this before, going to see uh, troops and saying, how many people voted for me? Or You're all supporting me. That's something you would never have seen in the past, That kind of that kind of political behavior at bases. That's highly unusual. And military people, retired military people, are really worried about it, using the military uh, for political moves. Um, but the morale, you know, it tends to be pretty good, I think, overall. But that's one thing that really troubles active duty people and retired people is using them as a prop. That's, it, it's so blatant, it, and that's really never been done in the past. Yeah, um, so I had the pleasure of being at NPR recently and working with Jaina Raff, um, who's another correspondent over at NPR, about um, reconstruction in Mosul specifically, and it's kind of funny because she compared it to the same thing. She compared it to Dresden as well. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious, I mean, you mentioned talking to your friends and, you know, saying, wow, it's very depressing over there, and you, you joke about it, but I'm also curious about how you as a reporter kind of deal and cope with the things that you're reporting, because I mean, especially, you know, working with Jane, she said that this was kind of a, a next level of, of reporting and, and things that you have to kind of deal with and see. So I'm, I'm curious how you cope with those things as a reporter. Um, I don't know. You kind of get used to it. I've been doing it for so long now, 10, 12 years. You see some things that are horrific, and I don't know. Maybe I, there's something wrong with me or just lack of emotions or something. I just kind of put it away and, and deal with it. You know, you're writing about it, you're reporting it, going to places like this, telling the story, I think, is kind of cathartic and getting people to understand that this is what happens. And it's, it's not just ISIS, it's American airstrikes, too, caused this, and, and Mosul as well. And that gets to a difficult question. And we've done a lot on civilian casualties, but a difficult question, because once ISIS or any folks get into cities, it's the worst kind of fighting, because you have to go in and get them. And you're making a choice between, do I protect the soldiers and Marines going in, or do I protect the civilians? It's, it's an awful choice, but that's what you're faced with. 
Um, there are two kinds of targets, dynamic targets and deliberate targets. And a dynamic target is your people are getting shot at from a building, they're downtown Raqqa. You have to deal with it right away. You have to take that building out or that floor or that area of that building to save your people. And sometimes you find out that you accidentally took the whole building down and there were a hundred people in the basement. It happens a lot. And the more bombings you see in Afghanistan now. What we have in Afghanistan now is like two punch-drunk fighters. The Taliban and the Americans fighting each other. Brutally. The Taliban just took out a couple of dozen uh, Afghan soldiers just in the past week. The Americans had a bombing run in Helmand province where I spent a lot of time. Killed 12 members of a family. It's going to keep going on until this thing ends. More civilians will die. The number of airstrikes in Afghanistan have gone up by like 50% over the past year. And no matter how careful you are, and they are careful because I've been there and I've seen it with my own eyes, you're always going to kill innocents. It's awful. All of it. We have time for one more question here at the front. Mr. Bowman? Nice to see you again. Ross Hanscom, a yep. student of journalism here. Um, so I kind of wanted to circle back to a, a trade craft question for you, less about kind of the broader aspects of policy and, and foreign policy and things like that. Um, I happened to read today, a, a week or so ago, a fellow named Antonio Garcia Martinez writing for Wired. He wrote a piece called Journalism Isn't Dying, It's Returning to Its Roots. And he had a theory, or he was kind of, it was more thought piece than anything else, and he was saying that in the era of Franklin and Madison and other writers, you had pseudonyms, you had highly uh, charged writing, you had highly opinionated pieces, and he's writing from a position that this era of objectivity in journalism is a flash in the pan, a 20th century um, pipe dream that we're going to see go away, especially with the blogosphere, with things changing, and in terms of partisanship in, maybe not partisanship, but, but lack of objectivity. So I'm just curious, your personal thoughts, obviously NPR has an editorial position on this, um, but I suppose I'm, I'm curious, your position on the idea of journalistic objectivity, whether it's even attainable, and kind of a secondary question, should it, if or if not it's attainable, should it even be aspired to? I think it should be, and I, I hope it's a flash in the pan. I hope we, we can continue being objective. I think it's really important. I think what we've seen in recent years is a balkanization of the media and um, you know, Marshall McLuhan talked about the global village, right? We'll all be connected. We're in that global village, but the problem is everyone's sitting in their own little cottage. And they're not going out. They're not listening to other people. So if I'm liberal, I can listen to Rachel Maddow every night and say, it's the word of God. Sean Hannity, no, no, he, that's the word of God. It's awful. It's, it's not journalism. It's not. You should be able to ask the hard questions of everybody, right? You shouldn't know the politics of a reporter who's sitting in that briefing room, regardless of who's there, or at the White House. It's, you have, to, the, the founding fathers thought it was important to have a free press, right? To hold government accountable, right? Now, if I'm a Sean Hannity, am I going to ask the right questions of this administration? Right? I have nothing against God, I don't know him. Or a Rachel Maddow if she's interviewing, you know, um, Bernie Sanders. Is that going to be a really hard-hitting interview or is it going to be a love fest? Either side. It's just awful and it's wrong. And you still have to create tough, objective reporters who are doing the right thing, asking the right questions. Because frankly, if they don't know any well. We just talked about Afghanistan. 18 years. How many serious hearings have there been on the Hill on Afghanistan or Syria? Why are you going to stay after ISIS is gone? On whose authority? No one's having that hearing. I think you may see it now with Adam Smith of Washington State because he wants to hold a lot of hearings. You didn't see it for years. That's wrong. It's important 
to have a free press to get out there and ask these questions. Thank you, Tom. Sure. Thank you.